So I'm assuming that most people listening will have more knowledge of ketogenic diets and ketogenic metabolism than knowledge of sleep. And so I'm going to spend a little more time going over some basic sleep physiology, and then we'll integrate these concepts. Two focal points from which we could view sleep effects are the metabolic and the neurological or cognitive. And interestingly, the same is true of ketogenic diets. So most of what I talk about will be centered on these. The mystery of what sleep is actually for, for from a physiological perspective, isn't really known for sure. That's not to say that there aren't people with theories, good theories with a lot of support. There are those, and I'll mention some of them, but it's not a question I'm going to even begin to try to answer here. What we do know with certainty is that sleep is needed, and we know that because we know some of the consequences of not getting it. And conversely, we know some of the benefits it provides. We also know that sleep is regulated homeostatically, meaning just that there's a drive for sleep, and that ensures that we get enough and we don't get too much. So one way that we can tell that sleep is homeostatically regulated is that the longer we're awake, the more irresistible sleep becomes. This pressure builds up, and it builds up essentially linearly the longer we're awake, and then it falls off when you go to sleep. But it falls off faster than linearly, and we'll talk about why. But to understand that, we need to talk about some of the measurable characteristics of sleep. So if we want to talk about the effect of a particular intervention on sleep, we have to have a way to evaluate it, not just the subjective way we normally talk about sleep. And there are different ways to do that. Duration is the most straightforward one. It means how much time elapsed from when you went to sleep until you wake up. But a nuance there is that from the moment you initially go to sleep until you wake up for the day, you might not actually be asleep the entire time. So that's where we talk about sleep efficiency. And that can be measured either as a proportion of time asleep or the number of wakings, for example, or typical ways. Sleepiness in the daytime is also a qualitative measure or a quantitative measure, it can be, of a qualitative part of sleep. So there are two typical ways that we measure that. One of them is simply by asking people to imagine themselves throughout the day in situations like stopped at a red light or curled up on a couch with a book, and you're asked to rate how likely it is that you would fall asleep in that situation. So that's uh, somewhat subjective, and so a second more accurate way is the Epworth scale, which you're at, you actually ask subjects to come into the lab and try to fall asleep, and then you measure how long it takes them to if they do achieve it. So the faster that you fall asleep, the more sleepy you're considered to be. Sleep stages are important, and I'll go into them in more detail. The basic idea is that we are measuring brain waves during sleep, and we find that we fall into these periods of characteristic patterns. And so when we're evaluating an intervention, we want to know how it affects those patterns. That's called sleep architecture. And then with circadian rhythms, what we're talking about is looking at a variety of physiological processes and how they vary throughout the course of the day in a cyclic pattern. So we can measure changes in these cycles that different interventions might induce. Okay, so let's talk about sleep stages. It's pretty easy to tell when an animal is asleep or awake because of behavioral things like being very still or in a specific posture. For example, humans would normally be lying down with their eyes closed. Also, lack of responsivity is important. So if you're making some stimulus like noise and the person doesn't respond, that is a cue that they may be, or a clue that they may be asleep. But we can also see differences if you look at brain waves using uh, electrodes, an EEG from the scalp. But once you start looking at the brain waves, you'll start to see that there are further distinctions that can be made during sleep itself. The primary distinction that we make is between REM, which stands for rapid eye movement because our eyes are moving rhythmically, and non-REM. And we cycle between those, usually starting with non-REM at the beginning of the night. So REM is physiologically in many ways like being awake. The brain is really active. But the primary difference is that in REM sleep, your muscle, your motor neurons are disengaged. And that's presumably so that we don't act out our dreams. Vivid dreams are a characteristic of REM sleep. There can be dreaming in non-REM, but it's rarer. 
And if you don't have that muscle disengagement, it can be very dangerous. There's a sleep condition called REM behavior disorder in which motor neurons are not properly turned off. It's thought to be neurodegenerative and it's very dangerous. Now, non-REM itself can be split into light sleep and deep sleep. Uh, and they have further subdivisions that we won't go into very much. But deep sleep, it's mostly, I think, called that to reflect the fact that the deeper the sleep that you're in, the less responsive you are, the, the more intense the stimulus has to be to wake you up. But it also corresponds to whether or not the EEG has a lot of delta waves in it. Delta waves are relatively slow, so we call deep sleep slow wave sleep. And what's happening in slow wave sleep is that your neurons are rhythmically in a, turning off in a coordinated way. It's called coordinated neuronal silencing. And, and this produces a high amplitude wave. So here I'm showing a kind of typical order, but it's not strictly ordered like that. In this diagram, it's called a hypnogram. There's a typical pattern of sleep stage transitions for a healthy adult over the course of the night. You can see we go through cycles of hitting various stages. The most important things to note are that most of the deep sleep in the blue happens in cycles at the beginning of the night. There can be cycles with deep sleep later in the night, uh, different from here, but most of the slow wave activity occurs in the beginning. And then most of the REM happens in the last half of the night. The differences between stages three and four here have to do with the intensity of the delta wave activity. Three and four are arbitrary cutoffs, and we can also look at it less discreetly. So here we have another hypnogram at the bottom in blue, and I've circled the areas with stages three and four. The hypnogram is derived in part from the red graph above, which is showing the spectral power of the delta waves. So you can see that these divisions into stages three and four come from amplitude cutoffs, but you can also see if you look at the area under the curve that most of the intensity happens in the first couple of cycles. And so now when we go back to the concept of sleep homeostasis, you can see that the nonlinear way that sleep drive falls off corresponds with slow wave activity. And this is one of the reasons that we associate sleep homeostasis with slow wave activity in particular. Slow wave activity and slow wave sleep are important for various things. And one of the things that they appear to be important for is uh, metabolic or endocrine level things. So we have a correlation, for example, between uh, body mass index and slow wave sleep. But we also experimentally can show that a deficit in slow wave sleep can result in glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. Most of what we know about slow wave deep sleep is connected to cognition. So slow wave sleep plays a role in memory consolidation, for example. We also have a number of associations in certain conditions where cognitive deficits appear. So for example, in Parkinson's and in Alzheimer's and even just in aging. Some people, some researchers have looked at the amount of slow wave sleep and made an association between the degree of cognitive deficit and the degree of lack of slow wave sleep. And then experimentally, uh, some researchers have tried to see if efforts to try to increase slow wave sleep could have a benefit on cognition. And they found that insofar as their efforts to increase slow wave sleep were successful, there was some association with improvements to cognitive deficits.